Da -da -da, da -da -da. Thank you for joining me today. It is the time when I'm doing my victory lap because yesterday I published three presentations to ASHA's convention for 2023. You can see virtual presentations. I have three presentations, so make sure to look up Kelly Vest. You're going to ASHA virtually. Make sure to look up Kelly Vest. You're going to like all three of them. The first presentation is on autism speech development, and I'm comparing children who receive the public school teach classroom intervention with our speech therapy in the public school versus speech outcomes for preschoolers that get the teach classroom and private ABA therapy. And I wanted to look at who had better speech outcomes. So the children that received the ABA therapy as well as the public school intervention have better outcomes than the children who simply received the public school intervention. That is a great research study. You wanna take a look at that if you work with preschoolers with autism. Check out that study. That's of 11 preschoolers who are mentally speaking, which we're going to dive into today. You're going to love that research. There's two other technical presentations that I have at ASHA, and one of them is on how to integrate Google Slides and movement into your therapy sessions. And then the next presentation is how to integrate phonological awareness skills into your speech and language therapy sessions. So I'm very proud of all three. They're wonderful. Make sure to check them out. You won't be disappointed. Just look at my name, Kelly Vess, if you're going to ASHA, ASHA 2023. So that's what I'm gonna dive in with you today. I found a treasure in this latest research. I had a eureka moment. You're gonna be the very first that I share it with my special podcast listeners. It's funny because I, I don't know who you are, but the people I've met that are podcast listeners are highly intelligent. So you're in a good group. I think we're a curious group that loves learning and that this is not a profession for us. This is a mission. This is a passion. We're innovators. We're thinkers. And we aren't interested in status quo. We're interested in the next level. Like there's that quote or whatever that people exercise to the top of your license. It's like, no, we like to go over the license. We like to go beyond what is um, currently known and what's currently expected. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I'm very excited to share this research. I feel kind of like a paleontologist and I'm working for years with a brush. And every day that I work with these children with autism, on their communication development or on their development in general, because it's multifaceted. I work on all aspects of it. It feels like I'm taking a brush and I'm taking notes every day. And some nights I don't sleep. And I don't sleep because of the speech development piece. That's the piece that I'm very much hyper-focused on, very much obsessed with and working on everything else that autism is, which is multifaceted conditions. So you're working on everything all at once. But the speech part is one that is something that I obsess over. I've made some revelations over the years. And in this current research that I'm about to share with you, and it's exciting because you're going to hear this before Asha, before I post it to my ResearchGate account, it's really good stuff, is I made a revelation about who is going to develop speech and who isn't going to develop speech and this is a really important revelation because I think oftentimes we, myself included, have a blind spot. So I'm going to talk to you about this and um, I can't wait to hear what you think. I would love it if you email me and share your thoughts. So I did the difficult research and the difficult research is when I get the greatest answers and that is language sampling. So language sampling children with autism. In the past, don't do what I did. I did this on audio record. I taped it on an audio recorder language samples with children with autism. Now, the problem with that is that children with autism, many of them have a speech motor disorder in which their speech is not only unclear, but it's unclear in an atypical manner. They're doing things like their vowels are off or they're substituting more difficult consonants like R for easy consonants like P or B. So they're doing all of these atypical things. So you're listening to an audio tape and the child's like saying, sus, rah, and you have no idea what they're saying. You have no idea what they're looking at, what the context is. So don't ever 
audio record children with autism just don't do it learn from my mistakes so what i did is i video recorded the children with autism what i like to do is share those videotapes little clips of it with the parents to let them know what we're doing in therapy in the beginning of a 20 week period i did language sample analysis for 10 minutes now i found in my research that 10 minute language samples were equivalent to 50 continuous language samples. We, we get the same results in terms of MLU. It was great that within one 10 minute period, I could get the same results. These children are not speaking in largely in long complex sentences. So there isn't much variation when the MLU is small. So when the children are speaking at single words, they tend to speak at single words. When children are working at speaking at two word for utterances, one word utterances, they tend to stick that way. So it's very consistent. When you get into longer utterances beyond three MLU, then you're going to get variation and you need longer samples. That's what my research found. So that was earlier on listening to audio recorders, and that was very painful to end on. And to let me just tell you about the study. Who in a 20-week period expanded the verbal output. That means they said more words, they said more different words, their MLU increased, okay? What I found is the children that said zero words in that 10 minute period, these children had the worst outcomes that were not one word came out, not one word approximation came out in that 10 minute period. 20 weeks later, the likelihood that these children would still speak, no words would come out, or only a couple words would come out is very likely. And so the number of words mattered and the number of different words seemed to matter. And this is 11 children. So we're not talking statistical significance. This is what it's like in my back porch, in my world. This is what a picture of my back porch looks like. What I found, which is more interesting, and this is my golden nugget, and this is my eureka moment, and this is something that I want you to look at in your own practice, is that it really mattered whether the child was saying words or word approximations. So the children I was studying, I was studying 11 preschoolers, and they all had a consistent working vocabulary of five words or less. We're talking about this is what I found. Now, this is like, write this down because I want you to look at this in your own practice. This is revolutionary. If it was words that they said, or if it was word approximations. And what became very, very important is the vowels. Could they produce diphthongs? So it was the child saying I for by, or was the child saying buh? I would prefer that the child was saying I. And why is that? And that's because when I looked at these 11 children, if the children were doing word approximations such as duh for done, ma for more, ba for by, na for no, these children had the worst outcomes. And I'm gonna tell you, this is why I think it is. The research indicates that we listen to vowels to understand what other people are saying. So if that child, when they were, for instance, when they were saying bye, if they said I, they're like, oh, they're saying bye. If they were, for instance, when they were saying more, if they said or, we'd say, oh, they're saying more. Ma is like ma, it's ma. So the children with autism often have difficulty with vowels. It's kind of like childhood apraxia of speech as well because of motor coordination difficulties. So they centralize the vowels, ah. Uh, so when I was looking at my videotapes, this girl said sus, and she had a number six in her hand. Now, the problem with that is that if I wasn't a speech pathologist who didn't know about that centralized vowel rule, I would have been like, she said sus, that's not the number six, but I knew about that. And I knew that the vowels give it away. If she would have held that six out and said, eh, someone would have said, that's a six. Yeah, that's right. That makes more sense to me. So what happens is, is that the tree is falling in the forest and the, the no one perceives that the tree has fallen, has the tree fallen. This child said sus, the child said the word six, but with poor, with a speech motor disorder. So then that is not gonna be responded to. 
if you do something and it's not responded to, then you stop doing it. So a lot of these times, these children are talking, but no one is responding to it because their vowels are wrong. It doesn't sound like speech. It sounds like, uh, 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 that that's not speech to us. We listen to diphthongs. That's how we want to understand one another. What I was finding is it didn't matter as much the number of words, which did matter. If I saw there were zero words to begin with in that 10 minute period or zero word approximations, and I must be honest with you, my research was showing these are children that didn't take off with verbal speech. More importantly, I found that it was in the vowels. If they did the centralized vowel, the, ba, ba, those children had equivalent results as the children that weren't talking, that were saying no words or no word approximations. And that was a whole other issue. When do you call something a word approximation? So my graduate student who I was doing the research with, for instance, the child was checking the checklist and the child said, gra, when they checked it, gra. And she's like, well, that's a word approximation for check. And I'm like, no, no, that's going too far. <laughs> I'm going to have this rule where there has to be something approximate to the vowel or approximate to the consonant, you know? So if the child did like, Duh for check. Okay, that's that's close enough. Duh, you said that they're close. They're stopping the affricate. You know, and it's it's closer. It needs to be close to the call the consonant vowel approximation to call it a word approximation. So that is a whole issue in itself. So what does that tell me? Now this is important. Okay, what that tells me is that we need to treat the speech motor disorder. And I call it a speech motor disorder. And if you see my book, Speech Sound Disorder is Comprehensive Evaluation and Treatment, my number one advice in this book, if you're working with children who are mentally speaking, is treat the speech motor disorder. So I say that, and once again, this research, this was a new finding, which I think is pretty revolutionary actually, is we got to treat the speech motor disorder because children with speech motor disorders don't tend to naturally develop speech. And there's a few reasons for that. The one I just mentioned is because their vowels are centralized, so people are not understanding it. So this child doesn't talk. I don't perceive that as to being speech. Therefore, the child is not talking. And because the child's speech is not responded to, the child stops talking. So that is one reason why. Another reason speech pathologists really have to focus on the speech motor disorder is that children with autism, when this is why I call it a motor disorder, Okay. There's neurological differences. There's differences in the cerebellum that's responsible for consistency, being able to consistently produce a complex motor action. We know that about children with autism. There's also differences in children with autism and auditorily processing. Over 90% of them have poor auditory processing skills. If you're not able to perceive the sounds, you're not able to say them. So there's that issue where speech is not going to develop naturally because you're not hearing it, and then you're not going to be able to say it. Then we have the motor delay, a generalized motor delay in the body, which is estimated to happen in over 90% of these children. So when you look at that motor delay, you have to think about what's happening in the body is happening in the mouth. So hence, we have these motor coordination difficulties. Hence, you're not hearing the diphthongs come out. You're hearing it centralized. So because of this, we can't just say, just play with the children and they're going to develop speech. Just talk to the children and they're going to develop speech. Even just give them an augmented communication device and they'll hear the words and naturally develop them. I'm saying that it's not going to happen naturally. I'm saying that we're actually going to have to add to all that we're doing. And I'm not saying to take any of it away. No. Does relationship build, building matter, play matter? Yes. 
Is that enough? No, there's other there's other things we need to work on. The augmentative communication, does that matter immensely? Does print matter immensely? Does task-oriented movement activities matter immensely? So we need to be able to multimodally communicate. Speech is in everything. That's one way these children communicate, but that matters too. Don't leave speech on the table. So what I'm going to tell you is that the speech motor disorder, as a speech language therapist, you are uniquely the, the superpower in that area. And I think that you don't want to leave that on the table and take for granted that this will naturally develop because that's not working. So we've been doing that. We've been saying, well, if we do the augmentative communication, if we do the play therapy, if we do the ABA, if we do the teach, if we do all the things, the play therapy, the speech is going to naturally develop. It's not. That's not working. What we need to do is we need to actually take a speech motor disorder approach. So I've shared that with you in my book. I show you what we do. I've shared that with you in so many workshops Look at childhood apraxia of speech and look at the dynamic tactile temporal cueing methodology and look at the slowing down of speech, teaching it in a multimodal manner. I've done it with many children with autism. We're using that. We're using AAC. We're using print. We're working from the body in. We're working on that relationship. We're working on that motor imitation. We're doing all of the above. Because treatment of children with autism is not an either or a proposition. It's an all of the above proposition. And I'm going to be the first to confess. Sometimes I feel like I'm playing whack-a-mole. So for instance, this year, I this past year, I've been focusing my efforts on high-tech AAC. And the children are doing great with it. However... I've kind of put the speech motor disorder intervention a little bit on the back burner because all of my eggs are in the AAC basket. I can't do that. I really have to think, okay, here's the AAC and I'm going to incorporate on top of that what I do for speech motor disorder. I'm going to integrate that into therapy. And there has been some case studies in which they did use a prompting methodology in addition to the AAC, and it did improve speech outcomes. But I know I'm with you. If you work with children with autism, there's so much to work on because it's so multifaceted. But I think that you can't take for granted that any of these areas are going to naturally develop because of the neurological differences. It's going to take some elbow grease. It's going to take some face time. It's going to take some hard work. It's going to take some relationship building. This is not going to happen with the pill. This is not going to happen with the computer program. This is going to happen with some elbow grease. And like I said, in taking a multifaceted approach to intervention. So that is the exciting research I couldn't wait to share with you today. You're my podcasters. You get to hear it first. And where can I take this? Okay, I am so busy. But if you want to do some research on your own, what I encourage you to look at is look at in a connected speech sample, if possible, look at the percentage of percent consonants correct. Excuse me. Look at the percent consonants correct. Look at the percent vowels correct. And I think what you're going to find is percent vowels correct will have a positive correlation in which the higher number of the percent vowels correct, the better the outcomes in speech and language expressive output. You're going to find the lower percent vowels correct. This is my prediction based on what I'm seeing. You're going to see worse outcomes in their expressive language development and their expressive speech development. Because if the tree is falling in the forest and no one perceives the tree falling, did the tree fall? If the child is talking, but their vowels are centralized and no one's perceiving their words, then is their talk actually at all being responded to? And will it become extinguished? If you want to look at an area, that's what I would recommend is looking at the percent vowel correct and look at that in the relationship to speech outcome 
and look at the percent consonant correct even in the relationship to speech outcome. I think the percent vowel correct is where you're going to find the stronger correlation. So that, my friends, is my treasure that I found in this latest research. I'm so excited to share it with you. It's time for you to roll up your sleeves, take on the world and make it a better place, one child at a time. You are always going to be first.